Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. There we go. All right. I know we're in the waning days of May. Uh, I'm Dr. Tim Smith, Associate Provost of the College, and I am uh, happy to welcome you to today's Provost Forum Talk featuring Dr. Bill Myers. Um, first, before we introduce the speaker, I have to give the usual uh, public service announcements. Number one, please, if you can, silence or turn off cell phones so we don't have that interruption. And then again, for those who we don't have as many this time, but those sitting towards the back, close to the video camera, we are always trying to record these for posterity. Uh, if you talk when you're close to that camera, the only thing that gets picked up on uh, the camera is your conversation. So um, we might get bits and pieces of Dr. Myers in between your conversation. So. We do ask that you please refrain from speaking if you're close to um, our video recording apparatus at the back. Uh, now to today's speaker, Dr. Bill Myers, Professor of Philosophy, joined the BSc faculty in 1996. He received his BA from the University of Central Arkansas and his MA and PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. His areas of interest have included American philosophy and pragmatism, the philosophy of religion, Ethics and Process Metaphysics. I don't know what that is, but it sounds really interesting. The title of today's talk by Dr. Myers, uh, Dr. Myers is Dewey, Whitehead, and Process Metaphysics, or How I Threw a Big Party for a Bunch of Philosophers. Please help me welcome to the podium Dr. Bill Myers. Good morning, and thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> I took my first sabbatical in the spring of 2004. On that occasion, I served as local host for the 31st annual meeting of the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy, which is the academic society where I do most of my primary research. Um, our theme that year was religion and civil rights. Um, among other things, we feature speakers from the Civil Rights Movement um, at a session of the 16th Street Baptist Church. We held a reception at the Civil Rights Institute, and our closing speaker was Morris Dees of the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, it was, by all accounts, a smashingly successful meeting. Um, well, guess what? Um, my, when sabbatical number three came up, I was asked to host SAP's annual meeting, and somewhat foolishly, I agreed. Every year when we do this, we have an artist who draws a poster that features the local things, and um, so this is, I'm, I'm actually up there too, uh, believe it or not, so this is featured on t-shirt and posters and all of that, and these are the philosophers that we typically deal with, there's a whole bunch of Birmingham kind of things up there. So this is the 44th annual meeting of SAAP. Our theme for the 44th annual meeting was a follow-up from Religion and Civil Rights. The theme this year was race. Where are we? Where do we need to go? Our opening plenary was sponsored by the Equal Justice Initiative of Montgomery. And if you're not familiar with EJI, you should be. Um, they need to be the, 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 it was founded by attorney Brian Stevenson and their mission statement says, the Equal Justice Initiative is committed to ending mass incarceration and excessive punishment in the United States to challenging racial and economic injustice and to protect our basic human rights for most vulnerable people in America. Our speaker was Evan Milligan, a law fellow at EJI and a BSc grad, a BSc alum. Um, his talk was called Confronting Racial Narratives, Binary Paradigms as Pretext for Slavery, Lynching, Segregation, and Mass Incarceration. This is in keeping with the theme for the conference that year. His talk was a spellbinding. Um, in it, he recounted the story of the Legacy Museum, which just opened last Thursday, very timely, just opened last Thursday. This memorial commemorates the over 4,400 lynchings that were done in this country from 1877 to 1950. The museum is located on the site of a former warehouse where black people were enslaved in Montgomery. In the making of this, they constructed more than 800 cord and steel monuments, one for each county where U.S. racial terror lynching took place. So that's how many counties where, where, where lynchings occurred. 
um, over 800 of them, and you can actually look, you can see the names of the victims inscribed, engraved on, on the monuments right here. Um, the names of the victims were on the columns, and these are hung at various heights to illustrate the various ways that black people were strung up or put on high for public view. Um, I have not had a chance to visit this yet, um, but I understand it is a very powerful and moving experience, and I look forward to it. And um, Evan was the one who first told us about this at our meeting. This was last March the 17th. Uh, so we're going to start with some highlights from the great big party out through philosophers. That's what we're doing here initially. Then we'll get to the dry stuff, okay? Every other year, our annual meeting features a founder's address, one delivered by a senior scholar. This year, we were honored to feature Leonard Harris of Purdue University. His address, Can a Pragmatist Recite a Preface to a 20-Volume Suicide Note? Insurrectionist Challenges to Pragmatism, Walker Child and Lock Lock, was both challenging and brilliantly delivered. Leonard Harris is kind of a rock star. He seems very cool. Okay? Now, on the lighter side, um, philosophers like to talk and share a beverage um, occasionally. Now, notice that, 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 that um, Jim Campbell um, up there, whoops, I um, was thinking some laser going on somewhere. Uh, Jim Campbell over there looks rather concerned, and uh, Armin and I, we must be engaged in something that he finds comes consternation with, but you know, that's okay. Um, philosophers, we do that. It's okay. Um, we also do formal sessions. Uh, this picture features Felicia Cruz Alexander delivering her paper, Metaphors of Embodiment and Musical Gesture. She's there on the right. A very cool paper on music and aesthetics. Note that the discussant in the paper is Brandon Underwood on the far left, who is also a BSc alum and currently working on his dissertation at the University of Hawaii. Um, um, you might also notice the abundance of tweed in our audience. Um, we are academics after all, and yes, that stereotype is alive and well. Um, every year, our meeting features a session called the Cost Dialogues, which is funded by our endowment. This year, we were fortunate to have the Reverend Tandieka, a Unitarian Universalist, Universalist theologian, journalist, and congregational consultant, who leads the We Love Beyond Belief project. She was given the Zosia name Tandieka, which means beloved, by Archbishop, by Arch, Archbishop Desmond Tutu in 1984. And that is her single name now, Tandieka. Um, she found, she's the founder of Affect Theology, which investigates the links between religion and emotions using insights from effective neuroscience. Her books include Learning to be White, Money, Race, and God in America, and The Embodied Self, Friedrich Schleiermacher's Solution to Kant's Call the Empirical Self. Um, she's no lightweight. Before receiving her Doctorate in Philosophy of Religion and Theology from the Claremont Graduate University, Tanyeka was a television producer for 16 years and is actually an Emmy Award winning producer. Her talk was titled, Whites Made in America, Advancing American Philosophies to the Philosopher's Discourse on Race, and her talk was utterly spellbinding. If anyone who was there can attest to that. Every year, our society awards the Herbert Schneider Award, uh, which recognizes a career-long achievement of distinguished contributions to the understanding of American philosophy. This is our highest award. Mark Johnson, the University of Oregon, who, with George Lakoff, wrote the groundbreaking book Metaphors We Live By, which we, which we read as when I was a freshman in college. Um, he was this year's recipient. Mark has gone on to do very important work on moral imagination and the embodied mind. And our conference always closes with a banquet. At the 2004 meeting, we were entertained by Strengthening the Black Church Gospel Choir. This was so well received that a number of members insisted that I get another gospel choir to perform, and lo and behold, BSC's own One Accord Gospel Choir provided the entertainment. You can see their backup band in the background back there, and they were fabulous, by the way. If you haven't had a chance to see them perform yet, put it on your calendar the next chance you get. They are, they are they're, they're wonderful. Now, for the dry stuff. Um, in addition to throwing a great big party for a bunch of philosophers, 
My sabbatical also included some scholarly work, as sabbaticals are wont to do. I was invited to contribute a chapter to Oxford University Press's handbook on John Dewey, um, on, on Dewey's metaphysics. This volume is intended to set the stage for scholarship on Dewey for the next 10 years. This table of contents that's up here, it isn't yet complete. There's about 14 or 15 more that are still to be added as, as, as these get finished. Um, but it already can, and it can, will contain even more contributions from the top scholars in my field. And I have to say, I am truly honored and humbled to be included among them. Um, my chapter, there's a second one up there on that list, right? Um, it's about 9,000 words for about 30 pages. Given, by the way, given the length of that, I will not be reading the whole thing. Um, I'm really grateful for that. Instead, I will hit some highlights, an application or two, and talk about some connections to some other things that I have done. So, here we go. As you can see, my chapter is titled Dewey, Whitehead, and Process Metaphysics. The chapter contains a primer on their two respective metaphysical systems. It contains some comparisons and then some applications. Time limits, of course, prohibit my doing too much of this, so I'm just going to stick to the stuff on John Dewey uh, because Whitehead is overly technical and that's a little too cumbersome. Trust me on that one. You'll be grateful for that. Uh, the connection between process philosophy and pragmatism is significant. John Dewey, of course, is a noted pragmatist. Whitehead is a noted process philosopher, but Dewey is a process philosopher too. So all of the classical American pragmatists are process philosophers, but not all process philosophers are pragmatists. Alfred North Whitehead and Charles Hartshorn, for example, are both noted process philosophers, and while there are pragmatic elements in their respective philosophy, neither is properly called a pragmatist. What connects Whitehead with a pragmatist is his process-oriented metaphysics. One common element to all process philosophies is that events are given ontological priority over objects. That is, in all process metaphysics, events are basic, while objects are characters of events, or more properly are considered are abstractions. Thus, there's an emphasis on relations and relativity in process philosophy. One significant difference between the pragmatist and Whitehead is in regard to system. Whitehead is nothing if not systematic. In fact, his book, Process and Reality, begins with a litany of the categories. 27 categories of existence, eight categories of existence, 27 categories of explanation, nine categorical obligations. It's, just like, it's like a geometry book, just, you know, just, it's, 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 it's notoriously systematic. Whitehead was a mathematician first, okay? Uh, While the pragmatists, they are not so systematic. Um, by degrees, they are less so. Um, for example, um, experience in nature, Dewey's major work in metaphysics is notoriously unsystematic. Unlike Whitehead's process reality, experience in nature does not begin with a complete listing of his categories, or as Dewey calls them, generic traits of existence. Instead, he uncovers them through very long dialectical arguments. This can make an identification of exactly what Dewey takes to be generic, difficult, and sometimes even controversial. However, there are a number of traits that stand out and are readily identifiable, and those will be delineated second section when we need to get to Dewey's metaphysics. But first, Dewey's, Dewey's book, Experience in Nature, which is his big book on metaphysics, from its very beginning had a mixed reception. Its publication in 1925 came with much anticipation. In 1923, Dewey had delivered the Karras Lectures, and this book grew out of that. Given the anticipation, the book was widely reviewed. It garnered 35 reviews within the first three years of publication. That's impressive, by the way. While most of the reviews recognized the book as a major philosophical work, assessment of that work varied greatly. Many of the critical reviews came from journals of religion, but even more sympathetic reviewers found the work problematic as well. Perhaps even more interesting is the wide range of views on the quality of Dewey's writing, from Oliver Wendell Holmes' famous comment that the book is incredibly ill-written, uh, ill 
to Perry, or Perry's observation of the book has a certain eloquence and persuasiveness. This perception, by the way, still holds today. In fact, there is a sense in which the book's reputation is in worse shape today than it was in the past. While there were critics in 1925 who disagreed with Dewey's position and those who thought poorly of his writing, today there are critics who are otherwise sympathetic with Dewey who claim that the book was either misguided or that it doesn't do what he says it does, i.e. metaphysics. Among contemporary interpreters, there are at least five sorts, and I will discuss them very briefly in turn. First, there are those who think that Dewey does not do metaphysics at all. Perhaps the most outstanding critic here, outspoken critic here, is Charlene Hoddick Seyfried, now retired from Purdue University, um, in her article, Pragmat Pra Pragmatic Metaphysics, Why Terminology Matters, Charlene writes. The pragmatists didn't just take an anti-positivistic turn. They didn't just reject the traditional areas of metaphysics. They grounded their analyses in the concrete conditions of everyday life. It's time to recognize that the formulation and analyses of these concrete conditions is a genuine alternative to metaphysics. Siegfried thus argues that the pragmatists were so tied to the concrete that metaphysics is precluded. Indeed, her feminist approach to pragmatism is one that distrusts the abstract as taking us away from concrete experience. Thus, whatever the pragmatists do, it certainly should not be called metaphysics. Second, there are those who think that Dewey does metaphysics, but he should not. Here we find primarily Richard Rorty as an outspoken critic here, who divides Dewey up into the good Dewey and the bad Dewey. Rory finds Dewey most useful when he's deconstructing traditional philosophical problems. Naturally, Rory is a fan of Dewey's book, The Quest for Certainty, which takes a great time doing that, deconstructing traditional philosophical problems. Dewey falls back into bad philosophical habits, according to Rory, when he tries to say something constructive, uh, tries to execute constructive philosophy as he does an experience in nature. Now, it's interesting to note that unlike Seyfried, Rorty recognizes that Dewey is at least attempting to do metaphysics, he just wishes that he had not done so. Third, there are those who think that Dewey does metaphysics, but he's not very good at it. Okay, he doesn't do it very well. This group actually has a long tradition. But one of the most recent critics um, is Richard Gale. Um, Gale clearly recognizes that Dewey is attempting to do metaphysics, but he claims that Dewey is deeply confused at every turn. Gale's approach to Dewey is largely analytic given his upbringing and training, uh, reflecting Gale's own philosophical training. Reading Gale on Dewey is reminiscent of reading Bertrand Russell on Dewey, and for Dewey, at least, is frustrating. Next. There are those who think that Dewey does metaphysics light, and that's okay. Larry Hickman approaches Dewey this way from SIU Carbondale. Um, he, Hickman approaches Dewey largely from a technological and instrumentalist perspective. For Hickman, Dewey's metaphysics is not as deep as traditional metaphysics. Uh, in a seminar I led at the Summer Institute of American Philosophy in 2005, um, I did one on Dewey's metaphysics. Larry called, um, he called Dewey's metaphysics a low-rise metaphysics not a deep or high-rise metaphysics. Finally, there are those who think that Dewey offers a robust process-oriented metaphysics. This is the position that my chapter and other places, other works where I defend. Others who read Dewey this way include Thomas Alexander of SIU, Ray Guavera of Siena College, Ralph Sleeper, and Jim Garrison, um, among others who think, who see Dewey as doing a, a, a robust metaphysics. Now, in order to get a sense of Dewey's reconstruction of metaphysics, the best starting point is actually not his big book on that experience in nature, but rather his 1905 essay, The Postulate of Immediate Empiricism. In this essay, Dewey describes his view of the relationship between experience, knowledge, and reality, calling his view immediate empiricism and he could have as easily used as William James's term, radical empiricism. The central thesis of his essay, this is the number one up there, of um, his essay is that things, anything, everything, in the ordinary non-technical use of the term thing, are what their 
experienced as being. Hence, if one wishes to describe a thing truly, his task is to tell what is experienced as being. Dewey goes on to use the example of describing a horse. The descriptions of a horse trainer, a jockey, a zoologist, etc., will of course vary with both congruences and divergences. But this is no reason to account any one description of the horse as being more real than any other, or for reducing some accounts of the horse to being simply phenomenal, or just merely appearance. Each account of the horse, assuming the account that is a description of what the horse is experienced as, is equally real. But what about contradictions among the accounts? These do not take away from Dewey's postulate. For Dewey, every experience is determinate. That is, it is exactly what is experienced as. It may be settled, confusing, frightening, illusory, and so on, but it is exactly what it is. That is, every experience is real, a confused experience is every bit as real as a knowing experience. This the distinction between a knowing experience and a confused experience is not one between real versus appearance, but simply is a contrast between different reals of experience. Every experience is a concrete, determined experience, no more or less real than any other. Note that Dewey's thesis goes against the traditional philosophical notion of experience as being primarily cognitive. For Dewey, things are not what they are known to be, but they are exactly what they are experienced as being. That is, knowing is not the only mode of experience. It is the one type of experience. Dewey uses the example of this essay of a startling noise. He says, quote, empirically, that noise is fearsome. It really is not merely phenomenally or subjectively so, that is what is experienced as being. Now, if we investigate the noise, we discover, say, that the noise was caused by a loose shutter banging against the window. According to his thesis, the knowing experience, the experience that comes about as a result of, as a result of inquiry, is no more real than the flustered experience, the frightened experience. They're both equally real, but no, they are not the same experience. That is, the thing experience has changed. Namely, reality has changed. I may be embarrassed by my fright, but the reality has been changed via the process of inquiry. It is, of course, correct that the latter, that the latter experience, that is, the settled experience, is cognitively truer than the former, but it's no more or less real. Now, as Dewey points out in a, in a note and in the essay, in response to reaction to the essay, commentators took much exception to the position he put forth. These exceptions, according to Dewey, are based largely on some fundamental misunderstandings of his position. One misunderstanding is that Dewey holds that human experience is somehow the aboriginal stuff out of which things evolve, thus making Dewey into some kind of idealist. But in the essay proper, Dewey says, so when the empiricist talks of experience, he does not mean some grandiose remote affair that is cast like a net around a succession of fleeting experience, experiences. He does not mean an indefinite total, comprehensive experience, which somehow engirls an endless flux. He means that things are what they are experienced to be, and that every experience is something. Note that this passage explicitly denies that experience is some kind of all-encompassing absolute. Again, in the added note of the essay, Dewey says, there's nothing in the text that denies the existence of things temporally prior to human experiencing of them. Indeed, I think it should be fairly obvious that we experience things as temporally prior to our experiencing them. So, from the postulate media empiricism, we can draw the negative conclusion that Dewey does not reduce everything to experience. But, all of this foregoing still leaves open the positive question of what the relationship between experience and existence is for Dewey. One clear statement of Dewey's position is found in a later essay, it's called Experience and Existence and Comment, which was written in response to a critic. Um, the critic was S.J. Kahn. At the end of his essay, Kahn asked, does Dewey's metaphysics include any existence beyond experience? 
Dewey answers this by saying that his philosophical view or theory of experience does not include any existence which is beyond the reach of experience. Notice the vast difference between these two phrases. According to Dewey, anything that exists exists within the reach of experience, at least in principle, and even though an experiencing subject can and does change reality, reality does not ultimately depend on any ontological way upon the subject for its existence. So let's consider some of the implications of what we might call Dewey's radical empiricism. One of the first things that should be evident about Dewey's view is that it results in a denial of the spectator view of knowledge. Dewey has returned experience and knowing to its rightful place, right in the middle of things. Also notice that there's an implicit process view of reality. If things are in fact as we experience them to be, then it must be that, ontologically speaking, things change. Okay? In the posture being empiricism and in experience in nature, Dewey is actually talking about the nature of reality itself. The question is, can he do that? Obviously, I think he can and disagree with some of the critics I mentioned at the beginning. In order to get at Dewey's reconstruction of metaphysical enterprise, it would be useful to appeal to Arthur Murphy's characterization of Dewey's perspective. Murphy describes Dewey's metaphysics as characterized by objective relativism. Okay? Uh, stated most basically, Dewey is a process metaphysician who, in contrast with tradition, inverts the traditional roles of objects and events. That is, events are basic and objects characterize them. In brief summary, then, objective relativism goes something like this. The world is made up of events. Every event emerges from a given context and is limited and conditioned by that context. This is the relative nature of events. But the properties of that event are real properties of that unique perspective. This is the objective nature of events. Finally, they are properties of the world as the world relates to that perspective. This is the interactive nature of events. Given this description, it becomes natural to say that our knowledge of the world is indeed relative, yet at the same time, it is still knowledge, i.e., it is still objective. So objectivity and relativity are compatible. So, is metaphysics still possible? Does Dewey's perspective, perspectivalism leave room for metaphysical inquiry? In his 1915 essay, The Subject Matter of, Meta Subject Matter of Metaphysical Inquiry, Dewey argues that in fact it does. The problem with traditional metaphysics has been its characterization of the subject matter. The, the problem with traditional metaphysics, then, is not, concern, not its concern with ultimates, but its concern with the wrong kind of ultimates. Instead of ultimate causes, origins, reality, the proper subject matter of metaphysics is a plurality of ultimates, all of which represent the ultimate, i.e. irreducible traits of existence. These generic traits are not anything mysterious, transcendental, or a priori. Rather, just as any investigative subject matter, they're discoverable through empirical inquiry. A proper metaphysics, then, will consist of an inquiry into an account of the generic traits of existence. Its function is to serve as a ground map for criticism. In order to understand this, one must realize that for Dewey, philosophy's job is primarily one of criticism. So philosophy consists largely of criticism, and metaphysics is a categorical scheme that serves as a ground map for the criticism. In other words, it keeps our philosophical inquiries on a coherent path. Dewey's use of the ground map metaphor is revelatory of his view of the nature and purpose of metaphysics. It's clear that Dewey holds no finality on either his or any other metaphysical system. Given this, the purpose of a metaphysical system is to find the basic traits of things in order that we can find our way more coherently while traversing a philosophical path. That is to say, the purpose of metaphysics is to aid in maintaining the coherence of the overall philosophical enterprise. Without the general metaphysical scheme, the philosopher is more likely to fall into incoherence. The ground map, to follow his metaphor, keeps one on a coherent course. So now we come to the generic traits, that is to say, the metaphysics.
Now, actually getting into a system completely, I, I, I teach an entire course on this, so we're not really going to get into, into the nitty gritty. Instead, what we're going to do the briefest way to describe it is the list and summary of what I take to be Dewey generic traits of existence. But first, a remark is in order briefly. A century ago, um, in the need for recovery of philosophy, Dewey says, quote, dynamic connections are qualitatively diverse just as our centers of action. In this sense, pluralism, not monism, is an established fact. And empirically then, active bonds of continuities of all kind, together with static discontinuities, characterize existence. Notice that Dewey here is describing the world as a place of connected pluralism. Perhaps a more apt description of Dewey's position is that the world of events is one of organic pluralism. The organic character of events points to the fact that events are dependent on the context for their emergence. Every event comes from somewhere that is a context structured by other events. The pluralistic character uh, points to the fact that events, once specified, is an individual. Dewey's organic pluralism consists in the interaction of these two characters. Now, given that categories are basic, Dewey's generic traits points either to an event's organicism or its pluralism. So for the, for the, for the pluralistic traits, um, these, this, the, these are the ones that point to individuality. Um, and he has chapters on these, the experience in nature, or some of them are just featured in chapters. Um, the first one is precarious, the uncertain and the unpredictable character of the universe. Uh, the second chapter, experience in nature, is called the precarious and the stable. In that chapter, he, he points out, this is historical analysis pointing out that philosophers have, uh, over the history, been obsessed with the stable, looking for that which is really real. I mean, the ancient Greek philosophers looking at the basic elements of earth, wind, fire, or water, they're, they're, they're trying to say that everything is made the same thing. So that would be to find some stability. Aristotle's notion of stability is, is in substance. So substance philosophy, everything is looking for the stable somehow, but Plato is fast with eternal, so that which is stable is real, so it's precarious, is denied reality. Okay? Uh, so the next one is immediacy. This is the presence of an event. It's exclusive, ineffable, self-sufficient. Events as immediate are not objects of inquiry, reflection, or experience. So this is anything that is present. This is to say you can't know anything about a present moment. Because by the time you ask about it, it's already passed. The present qua present is unknowable. Quality. Quality is immediate, it's had and not known, it's the basis of the unity of situations. An example he used about quality is being lost. So if we're lost in a forest, right, then the, the quality of lostness pervades the entire situation and everything is centered around trying to find our way out. Okay? Then there's temporal quality, which is duration, lived time, not measured time. Um, lived, this between lived time, not measured time is important. We're not going to get into this, this, this is a big one. Um, novelty indicates the uniqueness of every event. And finally, selective interest is the basis of self-maintenance and of the natural freedom of all things. So these are the pluralistic traits. These point to individuality. Then the organic traits. These point to connectivity, right? The stable, which allows for prediction and control, this allows for science. While things are precarious, there's also a bit of stability out there, and both of these are just facts about existence. Sociality, this indicates that all events occur in a context. This is a very general category. Transitivity points to the giving over of one event to another. This is the basis of the continuity of process, that things are always changing. Transaction, this is the interaction of events. This isn't the mere transition, but this is events being ingredient in one another. This is the basis of Dewey's process metaphysics. Uh, potentiality, every event has infinite potentialities. Um, and events potentialities are revealed in transaction. It's only when something's happening that we can see the events potentialities. And finally, tendency points to the tendency of every event to move towards completeness. Every event has a particular direction. Now, um, there are, of course, chapters to be written about each of these, but we're not obviously not going to do that at this point in time. Okay? Now, what, I wanna, what we're going to do now is to take a few minutes, we'll see how few, um, take a few minutes and to talk about the application of these metaphysics. Okay? 
Um, and let me, let me tell you a little story. When I arrived at BSC some 22 years ago, I was involved with a listserv email discussion group called on John Dewey. It was called the Dewey List. I don't know if any of you old timers remember these things or if you were involved in any of them, but these were very popular at the time. This particular group was a very vibrant group and it consisted worldwide of some of the finest Dewey scholars in the world. And when I was writing my dissertation, I could write a chunk, I'd be stumped at night, I could write up a chunk, send it out to the cyber world, the next morning I would have responses from the best scholars in the field. This, this, this was a very, very cool thing to do. Okay? One day, just after we'd moved here, someone posted a question about Dewey's ethics. Um, he noted that all philosophers, all of us who taught ethics, we can all do little thumbnail versions, you know, those, those sort of shortish brief accounts of Kant, Mill, Aristotle, you know, just, you know, maybe half the class or so, something like that. And, you know, so, so, so that, you know, you see, you wonder, can we do anything with Dewey's ethics like that? Because Dewey wrote a great big book on ethics, right? Well, at this stage, I had never studied Dewey's ethics in detail. I had read a couple of important articles, but I had never read the ethics. And, uh, but, however, I knew his metaphysics very well, okay, having just written a dissertation on it. So, you know what I did? I was false. I was brash. I was young. I took a stab at it. I took a stab at doing the thumbnail on Dewey's ethics, and the scholars on the list who knew Dewey's ethics very well responded and told me that I had, in fact, nailed it. I didn't know you studied Dewey's ethics. Well, I haven't. I know his metaphysics. This is just what follows. That illustrates that, 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 that you know, the, the organic nature of, of philosophy, if the metaphysics is there, if the metaphysics is a good one, then all the other stuff follows from it. Okay? In fact, that brief beginning serves as a basis for a later sabbatical project, and by the way, a chunk of that will soon be published. Notice, if metaphysics serves as a ground map for the province of criticism, all of Dewey's inquiries should flow from the metaphysics, and his ethics does that beautifully. Okay? So you know what? I think I'm going to back up a little bit to, to, to some of the stuff I did last time and try to tell you a little bit about Dewey's ethics and try to connect that with what I did this time. Okay, this is a briefer version of this. My starting point for Dewey's ethics is his 1930 essay, The Three Independent Factors in Morals. Uh, for Dewey, the three factors are the good, which deals with ends and outcomes, with utilitarianism, for example, the right, which would be Kant, which deals with duties and sanctioned by law or reason, and with virtue, or Aristotle, which deals with character formation. Now, let's just go ahead and jump into this and ask, where does this, be, where does this these three independent factors of morals, where do we place duty in amongst the utilitarians, the duty people, and the virtue ethicists? One answer is, right square in the middle of them. Um, we still, you know, given all this been said, we still have to ask, what should we do? How does this tell us what we should do? Should we cultivate virtue? Should we pay attention to consequences? Do our duty? Well, the answer is, yes, we should, in a sense. Um, in the seminal essay, uh, 1930 essay, The Three Independent Factors of Morals, Dewey notes that all three of these factors of morality, the good, the right, and the virtuous, are crucial to morality, yet they often conflict. But none can be taken to be primary in any exclusive sense. They are each of them ultimately irreducible. That all three factors have something to contribute, but their respective adherents have latched onto one aspect of our moral experience and made it primary. Dewey addresses the singularity of focus in human nature and conduct. This is an important quotation here. Hence, we must decline to admit theories which identify morals with the purification of motives, edifying character, pursuing remote and elusive perfection, Obeying supernatural command, acknowledging the authority of duty, such notions have a dual bad effect. First, they get in the way of observation of conditions and consequences. They divert thought into side issues. Secondly, while they confer a morbid exaggerated quality upon the things which are viewed on the aspect of morality, they release the larger part of acts of life from serious his moral survey. Anxious solicitude for the few acts which are deemed moral is accompanied by edicts of exemption and bans of immunity for most, for most acts. A moral moratorium prevails for everyday affairs. 
In other words, what he's saying here is that if one pays attention only to duty, you lose virtue and consequences. If you pay attention only to consequences, you lose duty and virtue. If those are ignored, then that's, that's a great sacrifice. Thus, the real danger of identifying any one of these three as being primary morality is that it results in a moral moratorium on anything that doesn't involve that one thing. And further, such a focus denies the uncertainty that conflict inherent in morals. So, let's consider these three factors of good, the right, and the virtuous in a bit of detail. No. More broadly, okay, Dewey argues that as categories, as principles, the virtuous differs radically from the good and the right. Goods, he knows, have to do with deliberation and desire and purpose. The right and obligatory with demands that are socially or rationally authorized or backed, and virtuous rights fit rights fit approbation. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap this up. To take any one of these three variables as primary is quite simply to oversimplify the moral life. Quite simply, living morally is a complicated affair, and Dewey recognizes this. So again, we have to ask, what are we to do? What should we do? How do we know what to do? Well, given Dewey's honesty, he admits and recognizes that no set formula is going to settle what is moral and tell us what to do. All three of these factors are crucial, yet they don't always agree. So, how do we know which to follow? Well, you know what? If you want to know any formulaic sense, then you're asking a question that simply cannot be answered. And you're asking one that betrays the complexity of moral situations and human affairs. And here we come to the metaphysics of moral experience. According to Dewey, all experience is situated where situation is a technical term. Most of our experience situations are fairly well settled. That is, we plod along our daily lives, um, entrusting our habits, rightly so for the most part, to get us through. In normal cases, our situations are relatively stable. Occasionally, though, we find ourselves in a problematic that is a precarious situation. These can range from the trivially problematic, what do I fix for dinner, to the massively problematic, what do we do with Syria? When, we, when you're in such situations, we engage in inquiry and try to reconstruct the precarious situation into one in which the problem is settled or resolved. Now, among our problematic situations, some will be morally problematic, which is to say they're held together by a moral quality. Again, we find ourselves in these situations, we inquire using our best judgment, the tools of inquiry that we have, and hope that what we do turns out to be consummatory but we can never know until after we've done it. As in any inquiry, moral inquiry involves the use of hypothesis and imagination. That is, the inquiry is experimental. The experimental use of intelligence in problematic situations is a necessary condition for converting them into consummatory experiences. Um, James Garlock says, this is a brief quotation, quote, the aim of Dewey's inquiry is liberative, not prescriptive. Consistent with his aim, Dewey regards a judgment of value to be a hypothesis specifying the conditions of consummatory experience in a given situation. Such a hypothesis is completely experimental, and so function of problematic situation renders it a judgment of value. Notice that this makes Dewey's view more scientific than, say, Bentham, who wanted to reduce morality to a mathematical formula. Okay? Bentham's view is less like science and more like math. A formula settles it. On Dewey's view, one might say that we have values and we judge values. Having values is not an intellectual even cognitive process, but making moral decisions is. All of us have values. The moral quality of our experience, when it is had, it is just there. It is enjoyed. This is where we start, but we do not end there. Like the scientists, we must begin with an assessment of the facts of the situation, we assess those facts, not the values we see as relevant. We attempt to discover the conditions under which these values occur so we can better deal with them, perhaps prolong them, make them better. This process deepens the meaning of our experience. The value judgment then is a hypothesis, one that we hope proves to be consummatory. Did you follow duty, virtue, or ends in view? That isn't what determines whether you did the right thing. 
The right thing is that which reconstructs a situation from being morally problematic to being morally consummatory. That is, one in which the interaction of the and stable results in satisfaction. Thank you. That's enough. There's, there's, I got more. That's, that's, that's all we have time for. Um, any questions, you think? You don't have to, if you want to. Okay? What's that? 
I assume, could you also get the falsity of the untrue, or is that wrong? Could, could some experience be false in relation to others that are relative? Uh, I don't or, think so. Okay, so well, let's say that you can't get the falsity, because you've got truer with reference to what you say something is one time is more true than another. And with reference to what? If it's not a reference to objects, it's a kind of process. What is it in reference? Oh, then that's in reference to the inquiry. Okay, well, to, to, to get it true, we have to have, we have to have an inquiry. So when we ask about it, then we know something about it. Because experience per se is not knowledge. So, so in the initial experience, um, I didn't know what, what that was. It was just experienced as being frightening. Then I engage in inquiry. Okay, now, now I understand, I understand it better. So it's a truer situation. I'm not sure if that really helps much. no, that tree is brown. Like, I may be right that the tree is green, but, like, his experience is still that that tree is brown. Does that mean that, like, both things are true at once, no, or is his true. experience real. false? No, they're real. Okay, look, both things are they're real. real. Because, because his experience of the tree is not being green, that's a real experience. That's not knowing. 
So if both there's something we have to then engage in inquiry and find out why you, why you're experiencing that tree is not green. So both experiences are, are real are and real. true at the same thing. They can coexist even, yeah. even if they're contradictory. But knowing experience requires us to, to, to ask about it, to acquire. Okay. But that doesn't make my experience less real. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Every experience is equally real. Okay. okay. Even if one is less correct? Yeah. One of the things that occurs to me as people are having this discussion, one of the things argument that I know Shane was making and that I'm trying to make myself. One of the things that's liberating about doing is um, he validates um, uh, the psychotic experience. Um, and really, it's psychotic. Yeah. And I think it comes from doing reading of uh, James' religious experience. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. And I think that, that if you thought about that, that's, that informs his understanding in ways that um, are, are really important. Um, it's also, uh, from his end, uh, it's also very important from our end that he can anticipate um, the validity of psychotic experience and say that this is real for that person. It doesn't necessitate in any way, of course, that it's, it's not knowledge. It's, well, that, that would be the way. You can also say that it's not true. Um, and, and we saw that before in, in, in the discussion. It has less, less truth to it than other things that are real, than other experiences that are real. I don't see this method, and I say that as a complete idiot in terms of philosophy. But this doesn't sound like metaphysics to me. This sounds much more like um, process philosophy, Phenomena, uh, the experiences that we've incorporated with phenomenology. It's a reconstruction of metaphysics from the transcendental a priori stuff to um, to an empirically grounded radical method or radical empiricism metaphysics. So it's different. Well, you know what? Um, it's our new now. Well, those who have 12:30 classes need to get some food. So um, thank you for coming. Thank you.